Hello, friends. It's Chop. Like I said, what's going on over at the Consent Manufacturing uh, f- Factory this past week? Because I think looking at the, uh, the paper of record, uh, the, the, the New York Times, and how they have reacted to this situation, I think, is very telling. Now, sure, sure. Like, you know, it's not like they've, I'm sure they, they have editorialized that the end of Roe versus Wade is a bad thing. And I'm sure they have, you know, uh, uh, featured articles or op-ed pieces from people, um, you know, bemoaning this lack of uh, this, lo- this loss of our fundamental rights here. Um, and I'm sure they've, they've demanded better gun control, you know, regulations or laws. They, you know, they, I'm sure they've, they've advocated for all these things. But as we've talked about for the last three or four episodes on this show, I think like at a certain level, everybody understands that there's nothing they can do. Or if there are the things that they can do are like outside the realm of what what can be considered acceptable and like, you know, still have a functioning New York Times as a paper and like the government that they cover and have to like sort of bolster leg- the legitimacy of would become untenable. So uh, it's just a number of articles this week in the New York Times, specifically on the abortion issue, has chosen instead to, I think, like, I mean, I think it's really telling about like the, the 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 gravity of where they are trying to sort of finesse the opinion of their like overwhelmingly liberal readership, and that is to basically accept what is happening and to um, realize that you know sort of like that it's not so bad, and that now that more or less you know complete c- complete rule by a, min- a moral minority of opinion is actually the fault of the people who are opposed to uh, this particular minority, that it's time to be nicer to them and it's time to understand them. And I think a, like a, uh, uh, a good example of that, and like, I, I don't need to go into this whole article, but uh, the Pamela Paul op-ed. Uh, Pamela Paul is now the head of the op-ed page. She used to be the head of the book review. She is married to Brett Stevens. And like, it, look, she's every bit as boring as her husband. So I don't need to read this article. Essentially, the, uh, Pamela Paul's article is about how, like, you know, the, the left and right have uh, come together to agree on one thing. Like, you know, women shut up. And she spends the first paragraph of the article talking about, you know, the abortion being criminalized. Then she spends the next eight paragraphs making a moral equivalence between the criminalization of abortion and what the extreme right wing and their stranglehold over the judiciary is about to do to women in this country and essentially like pronouns and trans people. And like, you know, saying that that, that both are equally a threat to women. And I think what's going on here is that what they're offering women in the face of the fact that their rights are being taken away from them and they're being taken away from them by a system that the New York Times is complicit in supporting is not to you know, uh, demand or ask anyone to fight for those rights or to resist this. But what they are giving them instead is uh, trans people to shit on and like to, to point to them as the reason for why this is happening. Rather than at anyone with actual power, they are going to basically give permission to, I think, a large swath of their liberal readership to blame uh, you know, uh, trans women and trans people like, as a whole for, for, the, for their loss of rights. And, and gay people too, like, like they're going to point to, you know, to put to trans people is like, oh, okay, like, like they're the ones that have gone too far and they have provoked this backlash. And like I said, I think it's this like using their authority to give permission to people to like and, and cajole them not to get angry at, you know, the Supreme Court or our political system or like I said, the moral minority that is now um, using the course of law to impose their views on the rest of the country, but to blame it on and attack a particularly vulnerable and small minority group i mean like it it doesn't matter if people are like um gen xers or boomers the only thing that a lot of people remember regardless of whether they lived through it or not is george mcgovern so like their their take on this the, the, the the past few years all they're seeing is like oh no we just we need to do bill clinton again we need to do exactly 1992 because we're in the exact same conditions. And instead of having like a sister soldier moment and yeah, we can also have one of those. We're, we're going to do this. I mean, it's got to be the, the, the blame has to go somewhere away and down. It can't go up because that, that has implications uh, that, that no one at the New York times and nobody who really reads the New York times is interested in confronting. So I mean, and, and, you know, people say like this stuff is used by like hate mongers to justify. And it's like to an extent that's true. But like the, the real goal of this is just to give you a narrative, as you're saying, uh, of, of blame that allows you to just continue not doing anything uh, because there's nothing to do. Like you see it with the Democrats uh, all the way up to the top, like just that article we were talking about. I got to I actually want to read go back and read the last line 
in that Biden article, if I can find it. Okay, uh, last paragraph is, beginning with uh, the country didn't elect Joe Biden. Yeah. Biden has been batting away complaints that he's out of sync with his party since before he launched his presidential campaign. The country didn't elect Joe Biden because they wanted a Democratic Donald Trump to go out there every day and divide the country more, said Cedric Richmond, who left his own seat in Congress to serve in the West Wing for Biden's first year. Democrats attacking Biden are scapegoating the president or distracted and not focusing on what they should be focused on. He saved democracy once by beating a tyrant. He's doing it again, but he doesn't do it by beating his chest. The attacks Biden is facing now are the same foolishness that got us Donald Trump. Hillary wasn't good enough. She's not fighting hard enough, Richmond said. That's what got us Donald Trump. That got us Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. Case closed. Case closed. This is what they tell themselves, that people who are outside of power, uh, who can only act individually as voters or citizens, are responsible for the outcomes that they are, from the center, supposed to be directing. And if that's the case, there's nothing you can do. So accepting things becomes the only rational choice. But to do that, you have to have a narrative that, 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 that is self-absolving. And and also like it's it's it I think it's it's more evil than that because like yeah you have to have a narrative that absolves everyone who you know created the situation we're currently living in and and deflect anger away from them or anyone in power but also you need a scapegoat you need people to blame and like I said with the Pamela Paul article it is very clear that like what they are giving you know women who you know uh, you read the New York Times or liberal women who regard themselves as feminists when it's confronted with like what do we do about this law this fundamental loss of our rights is to be like, well, it's, it's trans women who did this to us because they went too far and they provoked this reaction. It's like everything is all, always about like, oh, like the, the, the right wing, uh, they wouldn't have gone as far as they're going now had it not been for these like these things that even we're uncomfortable with. And we, and we can now fixate on that rather than like, let's say, encouraging our readers to, you know, resist these unjust laws or fight them and fight the people who are fucking uh, doing it to you. And like, you know, it's not just a Pamela Paul article. I'll also point to, I don't know if you guys saw or not, there was a, you know, a a news article that was a, essentially a profile of uh, like young women under the age of 30 who are part of the pro-life movement. And, you know, like the article does mention that like among that cohort of women under the age of 30 in this country, support for abortion rights is as high as it's ever been. And I'm talking in like the like 80 or above percentile. So, but like, I'm not saying it's like um, totally inappropriate to write an article that attempts to explain the mindset of these people, but the choice in focusing on this tiny minority of opinion within the broader anti-abortion movement to make it seem like actually, you know, a lot of young women are very uh, are okay with um, abortion now being criminalized, and let, let's hear what they have to say rather than speaking to the 80% of women or young women in this country who are terrified by this. And, and disgusted by it and, and want some sort of political leadership to fight the people who are doing it. It's just a question of like how you dole out sympathy here. Is the sympathy for uh, the women who are now finding themselves um, just completely uh, bereft of any access to um, reproductive health care? Or is it like the, or do, 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 they, do they and their fears need to be spoken to and understood? Or do we focus on like these like, you know, like uh, a 20 year old Catholic college students who are just like, yeah, I can't, I can't wait to support babies. Or I can't wait for our country now to like, you know, uh, truly show love to mothers and their children. Going back to the uh, like the first type of op ed. I mean, I guess this is like infected everyone now because like, well, you know, what else can you do? What else can you do? But like uh, pin all pin all your woes on uh, somebody else who usually probably did not cause them. But like, you know, OK, the, the, the thing with like birthing people and that shit um there was such like an incredible backlash to that with like NGOs that like, I, I, I haven't even really like seen it recently, like maybe like a couple times this year, you know, and I, I agree. It's like, you know, like annoying, but like no one, no one is whether they are like just a person online or yeah, like a, an op-ed no one could ever just be annoyed by something anymore. It has to have like a moral invective behind it because no, no consumption is free from political action. It can't just like be annoying and heavy handed. It's like yeah. the, it's the reason for every bad thing that's happening. Yeah, Felix, do you, I mean, to your point here, like the, the Pamela Paul article, like I said, it spends the first two paragraphs just dispensing with the reality that like the 
the right the right wing of like our political system in this country has just you know is now basically declared open season on women everywhere in this country then spends the next eight paragraphs attempting to make a moral equivalence between that and the idea of a 10 year old um not being able to get uh, you know abortion after being is on like the the same like it is the same level of assault on women and their rights and dignity as saying you know pregnant people and the thing is yeah do I think that like, sort of like um, uh, sort of like inclusive language like that gets a little dopey at times? Yeah, I do. But I don't think the people who um, uh, prefer that kind of language are in any way, shape or form a threat to women at all, much let alone a moral equivalence to the idea of, you know, uh, women dying from an ectopic pregnancy that could you know, uh, easily be prevented. Or, or this idea, like, and she goes on to talk about, like, you know, J.K. Rowling and TERFs, that, like, you know, uh, calling calling a woman a TERF or disagreeing with, uh, like, TERF ideology is, like, you know, call, is, like, calling a woman the N-word or something like that. Like, like, this is the same level of assault on, like, the dignity and humanity of women as what, like I said, like, the right wing who has actual power in this country, like, what they are doing. And, yes, like, academia and, like, you know, like, so, like dopey fucking, like, Twitter people, like, yeah, like, they are annoying sometimes. But, like, a, it's like really none of your business one way or the other. And it like, how much does it really affect your life or personhood in the same way that like this legal regime that like removes you of your basic rights does? Well, I mean, everyone's, everyone's in their own, you know, mind palace, right? It, it, you know, all the people that like devoted, voted in like the Virginia state legislature elections or the Virginia house of delegates uh, were like, I'm sick of how people are treating JK Rowling. It reminds me. It reminds me of like what people do with shooters now, where it's like they'll they'll see like a, a clearly like photoshopped image, like a clear like fake post, where it's like the shooter being like, "I'm I, I'm I'm a leftist and I'm a federal agent," and they'll be like, "Oh my god, I'm the only I'm the only one who can who can see this. I've I've cracked the case. The most online generation in history, and they cannot spot a fake to save their fucking lives because they don't want to. Everyone wants to live in their own uh their, their own created reality where their the sole thing they care about is the only thing that's happening. Every event goes through that. And <clears throat> along these lines, I did, I did want to uh, look briefly at what I thought was the most insane of these uh, New York Times um, opinion essays along this front. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this one. It's, it's the one by this woman called uh, Leia Labresco Sargent. Uh, headline, in a post-Roe world, we can avoid pitting mothers against babies. And essentially, the point of this article is that um, she she and her partner traveled to a Catholic hospital in New Jersey to terminate her ectopic pregnancy. But she but like but but in her mind, that's not an abortion. And um, tell it to okay. the judge, lady. Yeah. So, I mean, like, let's just read a little bit here. It says um, from a pro-life perspective, delivering a baby who is ectopic is closer to delivering a baby very prematurely because the mother has life threatening eclampsia. A baby delivered at 22 weeks may or may not survive. A baby delivered in the first trimester because of an ectopic pregnancy definitely won't survive. But in both cases, a pro-life doctor sees herself as delivering a child who is, is as much a patient as the mother. A pro-life approach to ectopic pregnancy may count in its similar procedures, but still sees it as different from an approach that equates to an, to an abortion. When a mother's life is threatened by the course of her pregnancy, there is a wide gulf between a culture that assumes she and her baby are pitted against each other and one in which both are valued. I mean, like, say what you will, but like in that situation, like they're they are pitted against. Well, actually, no one's pitted at anyone at that point because it's not a baby. It's it's yeah. like it's dead. <laughs> like it's there's no chance of it ever being born or its life being saved. And it is and like whatever that is, clump of cells or a fucking infant that you want to put out, it is very much pitted against your life. And a decision needs to be made. And the thing is, she made the decision that anyone would but is now claiming for herself this idea that like, oh, it's actually I, I didn't get an abortion. Even though, like the, the the procedure that she underwent was exactly the same thing as everyone else gets in that situation, and is now being denied uh, women in her position all over this country. Well, what she wants is just like basically a concierge service to give her a, a uh, like an elevated uh, abortion experience with essentially just uh, the trappings of a, of uh, of uh, a delivery, so that she can personally like resolve the cognitive dissonance of being confronted with something that in her mind is like not a not a legitimate medical procedure now she knows it is so she has to oh well time to just build a, a new justif justification edifice around this fact because as felix said you get to do your own bespoke reality now if you want it to be actually this is 
this isn't an abortion. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pregnancy plus. Then what are you going to do? No one's going to stop you. And if somebody is going to be there who w- wants to have the same fantasy and they're going to, they're going to sign on. Yeah. This is the, uh, this is also the official country of uh, mine is different. Yes. The, uh, mine doesn't count. And also like uh, w- whatever, um, However, she justifies this by saying that, like, you know, we went to a uh, like a Catholic doctor who delivered this ectopic pregnancy um, as if it were alive, even though it was dead and, you know, used the exact same procedure as what is, you know, considered an abortion. Um, yeah, like I in my head, like, you know, uh, th- this now we don't have to pit mothers and babies against each other. It's like whatever's in your head doesn't matter, lady. Yeah, it doesn't matter for the women in Texas or elsewhere who now have to be flown across state lines to have their lives saved. And it right. won't like, fucking help you if you lived the, in a different the sort state. of uh, nuance that she's uh, insisting upon is not possible uh, in a legal regime because it's about drawing bright lines and imposing penalties which stops people from doing things. She says here, uh, the specifications for surgery remain the same, whether the surgeon is pro-life or not, whether the mother kept repeating baby to her nurses or stuck to saying pregnancy. But I wonder if an observer in the operating room could have seen the difference. If my surgeon was visibly more tender as he worked, knowing he could be (laughs) the first person to see our child, a child who would not ever see us. Doctors can't value women more by dismissing our babies as worth less. Even women who support abortion access may find it jarring to have their child's life dismissed when they hope they would hold this baby. It's better to be honest about tragedy and loss than to pretend that only one person is on the table. So, I mean, the thing that's unspoken here is that at an abortion, like the doctor just like he comes in and he puts a cigarette up, but uh, out in your fucking navel and then says, all right, let's scrape this fucker out. Is that what the assumption here? Yeah. That like they do it wrong because they don't uh, value the baby. Like she's talking, she, the thing she's imagining, I cannot believe actually exists anywhere. Well, yeah, I mean, if you ever if you ever wanted uh, proof that American Catholics are Protestants, I mean, yes, they, they they've moved predestination up now where it's actually every event of your life. Yeah. Every <laughs> like they, they they can look outwardly the same, but if you're a bad person, when you get an ado- when you get an abortion, your doctor is Jamie Kennedy from the Roe v. Wade movie. <laughs> And he sticks his hook hey, nose up your cunt, thing. and, oh, and I can make brains the baby with his with his Shylock nose, and then uh, like put, puts a puts a hundred dollar bill in your asshole and gets change for it, <laughs> that, uh, just like out of your urethra, like a coin star. Uh, but if you're like a good person, if you're if you're religious, if you're Catholic, you you go in there and you're like, hey, I want my assuredly dead baby delivered, and the doctor is like, absolutely. And the, you, the, you feel no pain, and it comes out, and he's alive. But uh, then he's just he's needed in heaven. And what you just got was not an abortion. It was just like um, God needed him. God needed that baby to uh, uh, be alive for like four seconds before well, in he this came case, out. The baby was never alive. It, 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 it did not take a breath. It, it did not die. It was already dead. And you know, like yeah. you know, like look. Uh, I'm, I'm happy this woman was able to avail herself of uh, medical treatment that comported with her whatever you know uh, religious uh, beliefs that she may have. But the thing is, like necessarily, uh, if we as a society are going to begin catering to those religious beliefs at the expense of everyone else, it doesn't fucking matter. And I don't, I don't, I like, I don't really care. And also, it's just like back to my original point. Like, why the paper of record in this moment in time at this like fundamental like like rupture in american history and culture do they feel the need to um hold up people like this as essentially like sympathetic or voices worthy of being included in this debate at the expense of the reality of like the not just the majority of opinion in this country but what i would think like any reasonable person would fucking rate like the 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 severity of like the kind of like the the scales of what's at stake here and i'm just going to read one more thing here uh she says Speaking of um, sort of the uh, boutique abortion experience that um, she's hoping to have, she writes, I knew that the Trappist monks of New Melloray Abbey would send us a tiny coffin free of charge as part of their ministry to bereaved parents. My husband's my husband knew that if anything went wrong, I wanted him to order an adult sized one for me. We didn't get to bury our baby and my husband didn't have to bury me. 
One surgeon had been right. Our baby died some time ago, and all he could find was the placenta. But while I recovered at home, we had something to know our baby by. We named this child Chameleon after St. Camillus de Lellis. He was a 16th century gambler who was treated so poorly by his doctors that he founded a nursing order and ultimately became a priest and saint. No, they named their kid after Chameleon Air. Come on. <laughs> yeah. We know. We know you like that song. It's it just like, like there's like the 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 anger that's that that is being given voice to is like okay if you're angry about it the only people like seemingly that are uh being being allowed to express their anger are the anger of people like Pamela Paul and J.K. Rowling and it's anger directed at trans people not at fucking right wing Supreme Court justices and the politicians that enable them and it's just like okay if there's sympathy to be made it out here if there's or if there's if there's if there's people's lived experiences that need understanding. It's, I'm sorry, it's this daffy fucking broad who's just like created some carve out in her head for her fucking religious beliefs that she that she is choosing now to take away from everyone else. And this, that somehow that that's worthy of a fucking uh, like uh, is crediting uh, morally as a point of view. Yeah, I mean, it's about validating your own fantasy world by invalidating what you're you want, imagine somebody else's world as, you know, like you have to accept my head canon. Uh, that's basically what we're in now—a battle of. Well, let's say like whose head cannon uh, counts and whose doesn't. Yeah, and exactly. It's pretty clear what, what that what the choice has now been made by. Well, like I, said, I mean, the, uh, the, it, the it's not really a choice, though, is it? Like, Times. who who else is who else's uh, head cannon is going to count? People with money and power and influence, or people without? Like, there's not. That's not really a contest. It's like the, well, the water finds its own level. There's no other choice they can make. You know, it just it speaks to the institutional realities and structures that 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 govern like content at that level i just think i mean i like just these examples i've been talking about i think it's very clear that like you know the the establishment media the consent manufacturers are very clearly uh like have decided as you know maybe rightly so that there's nothing they can do about this or like there's no going back now so rather than encourage people to uh, resist this i think they're very clearly choosing to cultivate a sense of sympathy with the people who are doing who are who are inflicting this evil on the rest of us is that you know we we should we should uh, be encouraged to see things from their point of view rather than our own or or to fight them at all 